Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Studying Environmental Sensing and Response in a Bacterial Plant Pathogen Inside Out, presented by Ann Stevens, Professor of Microbiology, Department of Biological Sciences, Virginia Tech. I'm Alexis Krause of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stevens. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for participating today. And I'm glad to join you and discuss the work in my lab on environmental sensing and response in the bacterial plant pathogen. On this first slide here, you see a number of small young corn plants. On the far left is a healthy corn plant. As you move from the left to the right, you'll see a series of plants showing increased disease due to wilt. And on the far right, of course, is a plant that has died from wilt disease. We study a bacterial pathogen that causes this wilt disease. The bacterium is Pantoea stewardii, subspecies stewardii. It is a gram-negative rod in the Enterobacteriaceae family, and it has a characteristic yellow pigment, as you can see from the colonies in the circular inset in the slide. It is the causative agent of Stewart's wilt disease, and the principal host that is um, damaged by this bacterial pathogen is maize, particularly sweet corn and popcorn varieties. Field corn varieties often have been bred resistance to it. The disease is primarily transmitted to the young corn plants by the corn flea beetle. This beetle is native to North America. Thus, the disease is most prevalent in North America, in particular in the Midwestern states and Mid-Atlantic states. Seed corn has to be screened for presence of the bacterium to prevent its dissemination on a global scale. If you look in the bottom series of pictures, what you see on the far left is a corn flea beetle on a, a, a leaf of a corn plant. The beetle scratches the surface of the leaf during its feeding, and then it defecates into the wound. And in this manner, the bacteria are introduced from the intestinal tract of the beetle into the apoplast of the leaf tissue. In the next panel to the right, what you can see is the first stages of the disease result in water soaking lesions. The bacterium encodes a type three secretion system and re it releases effectors into the plant cells that produce this characteristic streaking and necrosis of the plant tissue. As the disease progresses, as you see in panel three, the bacteria move from the apoplast of the leaf tissue into the xylem where they form a thick biofilm. This biofilm blocks water flow and ends up producing wilt, as you see on the far right-hand panel, which can cause um, damage to crop production or ultimately death in the case of some plants, particularly if they're inoculated with the bacterium as young seedlings. The beetle will, can refeed on infected corn plants, and thus the life cycle of the bacterium can, can be continued. And the incidence of disease in corn is proportional to the survival of the beetles over the winter. So the bacterium overwinters within the intestinal tract of the corn flea beetle. The biofilm that is the primary cause of wilt is a process that is controlled by bacterial quorum sensing. 
The process of quorum sensing is widespread amongst a number of eubacteria, bacteria, and the principle of it is shown in this slide. The large yellow circles represent bacterial cells, and the smaller maroon circles represent signals that are produced by the bacterial cells. When you have a bacterial population growing at a low cell density, it has produced a low quantity of these signals. However, as the concentration of the population rises, its density increases, the, popula or the concentration of the signal also proportionally increases. This allows the bacterial cells to behave as a coordinated unit and to express phenotypes of importance to them in a concerted manner. The process of quorum sensing was first identified in a number of bioluminescent marine bacteria where it controls bioluminescence. And then it was subsequently found that a number of pathogens use quorum sensing to control expression of virulence factors. And so what this allows the bacteria to do is to at first enter the host underneath the host defenses build up a population, and then as a coordinated unit, express all the virulence factors as a, as a coordinated group population to be more successful in invading the host. So biofilm formation in Pantoeus duardii is controlled by quorum sensing. This slide shows you the signal that is produced by Pantoeus duardii. It is an acyl homoserine lactone molecule, and its structure is shown here. A specific molecule is 3 hexanoyl homoserine lactone. Interestingly, this is the same quorum sensing molecule that is the primary autoinducer or acyl homoserine lactone produced by the bioluminescent bacterium Vibrio fischeri. A protein called ESA-I is the autoinducer or AHL synthase, and it produces this quorum sensing signal. And there is another important protein, ESA-R, that senses the signal and is the master quorum sensing regulator. It is a transcription factor that can bind to promoters and control expression of a number of genes in response to the quorum sensing. Work in a number of labs has identified that quorum sensing in Pantoeus duardii controls capsule production. The capsule in Pantoeus duardii is actually known as stewartinin, and it's important to the biofilm formation. It's also known that quorum sensing controls surface motility, also important to biofilm formation. And of course, then the biofilm is important to virulence. In addition to this, there are other virulence factors also produced by Pantoeus duardii that are not under quorum sensing control. This includes its pigment production, molecules important for iron acquisition, acetylic toxin, and um, other stress responses. And a lot of this work has been performed in the labs of Suzanne von Bodman and Caroline Roper. Today, I wanted to talk more about the quorum sensing response in Pantoeus duardii. And so the way this system works is actually quite novel. In most quorum sensing systems, such as that of the marine vibrio fisheri, the regulatory protein becomes functional at high cell density. In other words, when the autoinducer concentration builds up, that's when you get effects of gene expression being differentially regulated. In the case of Pantoeus Pantoeus duardii, it's the opposite. The regulatory protein actually binds to the DNA in the absence of the AHL signal. And this is what you can see in the green inset here. So at low cell densities, ESA-R can bind to the promoters that it regulates. If it binds in the position near minus 10, it's going to repress expression of the gene downstream of that promoter. And if it binds more upstream, say at a position near minus 42 and a half, it's going to serve as an activator and enhance gene expression. When the population switches to a high cell density, the AHL actually renders the ESA-R protein non-functional. It's no longer able to bind to the DNA. So you get a reverse of the um, gene expression patterns that you saw under low cell density. So genes that were initially repressed now become derepressed or expressed. And genes that were initially activated at low cell density are now deactivated at high cell density. This type of quorum sensing system allows the bacteria to precisely coordinate 
the timing of subsets of genes, both at low cell density and high cell density. And we know that this is critically important to the success of Pantoea as it is causing disease in the plant. If you have mutants that are incapable of performing form sensing, they are avirulent. And also, if you have constitutively expressed quorum sensing systems, so the quorum sensing system is always on, the temporal expression of the genes is not correct, and so the biofilm can form too early, and this also renders the strains a virulent. My lab was interested in understanding more about some of the direct targets of the ESA-R protein and how global the quorum sensing response is in this bacterium. So prior to starting this work, it was known that ESAR controlled capsule production. My lab performed two studies. We performed a proteomic level analysis where we looked at what proteins were expressed at high cell density um, under, during form sensing and low cell density, in comparison to low cell density. And we also looked at the transcriptome that was regulated by form sensing. And so the majority, but not all of the genes that we identified here, this diagram is focused on three groups of genes that we found had similar related functions. We found that ESA-R was regulating a number of genes associated with stress responses. This would be expected as the bacterium is going to encounter host defenses that are going to create stress on, on it as the plant is trying to fight off the infection. In addition, we found genes important for cell envelope and capsule synthesis, and this had been predicted because it was not already known that capsule production was under the control of form sensing. We also found genes associated with surface motility and adhesion. And so there are two genes that particularly caught our attention. That was the gene RCSA which is a transcription factor associated with controlling capsule production, and LRHA, which is a transcription factor associated with controlling surface motility. And so through a number of studies in our lab, we were able to develop a better understanding of the interplay between the regulatory factors ESA-R, RCSA, and LRHA. And so as you can see in this diagram, ESA-R, when it's active at low cell density, actually auto-represses itself. It also represses RCSA. This prevents RCSA from act activating capsule production at low cell densities. In addition, ESA-R itself coordinately controls some of the targets under RCSA regulation and represses them, further preventing capsule from being formed at too early of a stage during the bacterial growth. ESA-R activates LRHA, which serves as a repressor for itself, for RCSA, and for a number of downstream targets that are associated with surface motility. And ESA-R also coordinately controls some of those same targets by repressing them. Thus, from RCSA, you can see there's a type 2 feed-forward loop, and from LRHA, there's a type 3 feed-forward loop. When the cell density reaches a high concentration, ESA-R will become inactivated, so it will no longer repress RCSA or its downstream targets. It will no longer activate LRHA or repress its downstream targets. Thus, what now happens is LRHA is no longer expressed, so it's, you get derepression of its targets, and RCSA is expressed, and you get expression of its targets leading to capsule production. All of the work that I've described to you up to this point was done in vitro, in liquid or plate culture. And so we had a strong interest in actually trying to understand what is actually going on inside the plant. And so we decided to look inside out by performing in-plant studies and determining what was occurring as Pantoea was progressing through its um, stages of infection of the plant. Specifically, we focused at the xylem stage of the infection when the bacteria are at high cell density. And we decided to use a global level analysis. 
The first procedure that we did is something called RNA sequencing, or RNA-seq for short. And our experimental design is shown here in this diagram. We grew the bacterial cells three different ways. We grew them in planta, as you can see on the left. We also grew them in two in vitro conditions. In the middle, you can see we grew them on a low nutrient agar medium. We were hoping that this would to some degree mimic the high density growth of the bacteria within the xylem by allowing the bacteria to grow to a high cell density on a low nutrient medium. And on the far right, you can see we grew the bacteria in liquid culture. And this liquid culture served as the pre-inoculum for infecting the plants using the xylem infection model. So we harvested DNA from implanta, from the plate, and from the pre-inoculum liquid culture. We purified the RNA, and then we used it for two types of experiments, RNA sequencing and quantitative reverse transcription, PCR. An overview of the RNA-seq approach is given here. As I mentioned, you start with total RNA that you extract from your environment of interest. We then next depleted the ribosomal RNA, as this is the majority of the RNA recovered from bacterial cells initially. This allowed us to enrich for the messenger RNAs that we were most interested in studying. We then converted those messenger RNAs into a cDNA library, which underwent next generation alumina sequencing and produced transcriptome reads that were um, could be correlated with different genes across the genome. We used the then available incomplete genome of Pantoea stewartii to align our sequencing reads to the annotated genes in the genome. And then we followed this with some bioinformatics analysis using Genius to map the genes to the genome and then perform subsequent data analysis. This is the type of output that we were able to produce. We had approximately 30 million reads from each one of our samples, and we were able to compare the level of gene expression in planta versus our two in vitro growth conditions. So in the top in panel A, you see the in planta versus the pre liquid gene expression, and in the lower panel B, you see the in planta versus the plate-grown cells. In each one of those diagrams, you'll see a green line. Any dots above the green line, either gray or green, represent genes that were expressed fourfold or higher in planta. So these are genes whose expression is activated when the bacteria are grown inside the plant. The red line represents the fourfold or below cutoff for genes that are repressed. So any gray or red dots below that red line are genes that are repressed when the bacteria are grown inside the plant. So you can see that the majority of the genes were not differentially regulated, but in all, we had over 500 genes representing about 10% of the genome that was differentially expressed. To independently validate these results from the RNA-seq, we wanted to perform a QRT-PCR analysis. And so for that analysis, we picked a subset of genes. And the colored dots that you see on the diagram are the genes that we selected. So we selected seven, sorry, eight genes that were activated in planta, two genes that were repressed in planta, and the three black dots represent constitutively expressed genes that we were able to use as a control in our QRT-PCR analysis. The workflow that we performed for this QRT-PCR is shown here. So we selected our genes of interest, as I just mentioned, and we first cloned them into the PGMT vector. This allowed us to purify DNA template of a known quantity so that we could optimize our primers to an efficiency of binding between 90 and 110%. We then separately re-inoculated our bacteria into plants re-isolated the RNA, and then performed QRT-PCR on the cDNA that was amplified from that total RNA, and calculated the relative transcript expression levels using the FAFL method. Our results are shown here. What you see on the left are the genes that were activated in planta, either in comparison 
to the liquid culture, panel A on the top, or to the plate, and panel C on the bottom. On the right-hand side of the diagram are the two genes that were repressed in planta. Again, panel B on the top representing in comparison to the liquid growth, and panel D on the bottom in, in comparison to the plate ground growth. The white bars in all of these panels represent the data from the RNA-seq analysis, and the black bars represent the data from the QRT-PCR analysis. What you can see is the absolute values are not exact, which is, is not what you would expect given the high sensitivity of these methods, especially that QRT-PCR is a logarithmic progression, and so it can generate significant error. But the overall trends hold up consistently. And so and this confirmed to us that our findings for the RNA-seq were indeed correct since we had independently validated the results for these 10 genes. This gave us confidence to move forward in our analysis of the RNA-seq data. And so we've performed a gene ontology analysis shown here. The top panel again shows the results from the implanta culture in comparison to the liquid culture, and the bottom panel shows the implanta culture compared to the plate culture. In both cases, the red bars represent genes that were highly repressed, and the green bars represent genes that were highly activated. And so this bioinformatic approach clusters genes of related function together so that you can see trends in your data. And what immediately stood out to us was the high number of transporter genes that are activated in planta, whether we compare it to the broth culture or to the plate culture. The transporters that were upregulated included large numbers of those for amino acids, including alanine, arginine, aspartate, glutamate, histidine, isoleucine, lysine, and valine, and sugars such as arabinose, galactose, ribose, and xylose. And we saw a few other interesting transporters upregulated, including those for ammonium, magnesium, molybdate, sulfate, and taurine. Plus, a couple of transcription factors also show associated with control of transport. So clearly, the plant this is creating an environment that triggers the bacteria to significantly upregulate its transport functions. In addition, another highly upregulated group of proteins were the oxidation reduction processes group. And this encompasses a wide variety of genes. One of the genes upregulated was cytochrome D. This suggests that the bacteria are facing a microaerophilic environment inside the xylem of the plant. There were also stress response functions upregulated, such, such as superoxide dismutase and nitric oxide, oxide dioxygenase. And interestingly, some redox processes associated with metabolism also fell into this category. And so we saw an upregulation in fatty acid metabolism and glyoxylate cycle genes, suggesting a shift in the metabolic profile in planta. And we saw a number of other metabolic dehydrogenases that were upregulated as well. So collectively, what we've learned from the RNA-seq analysis was that when Pantoeus duardii is in a biofilm, in the xylem of the plant at high cell density, it is upregulating a large number of nutrient transporters, especially those associated with sugars and amino acids. It's upregulating stress responses presumably in response to host defense, and it's alterating its metabolism. And so our hypothesis is that Pantoeus duardii is responding to implant and nutrient availability host def defenses with the expression of specific genes in response to that environment. What we do not know is yet is if the nutrients available in the xylem are always present or if the bacterium is actually altering the host metabolism to its benefit. And my collaborator at Ohio State University, David Mackey, is exploring the specific question through metabolomic studies, that, excuse me, metabolomic studies, which we hope to coordinate with these transcriptome studies. 
Another interesting finding not stated here, but something that we observed in the RNA-seq is that the type three secretion system was also upregulated. And this was a little bit surprising because it was thought that that was only important in the apoplast stage of infection. So we were able to complete the RNA-seq analysis using the genome sequence that was available to us at that time. But it was quite a challenge because it was an incomplete genome and it was in a number of contexts and quite complicated and difficult to work with. So, so that we could do additional genome-wide level analysis, my lab decided to finish the genome assembly of Pantoeus duardii. And we did this using Illumina mate, mate pair sequencing with an insert size of 3,500 base pairs to help us get across highly repetitive regions in the genome. Once the genome was assembled, we were able to determine that it is 5.3 kilobase pairs in size. It consists of one circular chromosome and 10 circular plasmids. One very interesting thing we found about the plasmids was that two of these plasmids each encode a type three secretion system. One of the plasmids encodes a type three secretion system that is specifically utilized during the plant infection and another plasmid encodes a completely separate type three secretion system that has been shown to be important for its maintenance within the intestinal tract of the corn flea beetle. In addition to these plasmids, one linear phage was identified. And in the end, we found that the genome had over 400 highly repetitive transposase sequences. And this is likely what was contributing to the difficulty in assembling the genome for such a long time. Using this complete genome, we were able to move on to another type of analysis called transposon sequencing, TN-seq for short. This is a method that has actually been used quite a bit in animal model systems. But our work is one of the first studies where TN-seq has actually been applied to be used in a plant system. And so the, this approach is um, outlined in this diagram that I borrowed from a nature review. You first generate a transposon library in your organism of interest. In our case, we used a Mariner-based transposon system and used it to create a library of 40,000 different mutants of Pantoeus duardii. That mutant library is then used to inoculate under the growth conditions that you're interested in testing. So condition A, in our case, was a liquid-grown um, broth culture of Pantoeus duardii. And in, in our case, condition B was not a mouse, but of course was a juvenile corn plant or a young corn seedling. So you allow the bacteria with the transposon mutations to occupy these two environments. And then you extract the DNA out of the bacterial cells after they've grown in those environments for the same number of generations, and you sequence the DNA and look for what transposons were able to survive or what tr transposon mutant strains were able to survive in the host versus which ones were eliminated. How you interpret this information is shown better in this slide and hopefully this will make it, it a little bit clearer. So the top half of the slide is the control library. So this would be the culture that we grew in liquid broth. And the bottom half, or condition B, would be your test library. For us, this would be the implant of growth conditions. What you see looking at the top, condition A, is we're focusing here on three example genes, genes A, B, and C. And in mutant one, gene A had the transposon mutant in it. In mutant two, gene B had the transposon mutant. And in mutant three, gene C had a transposon mutant. The reads that we get from the sequencing of the um, DNA extracted from our samples gives us read counts that are aligned to the annotated genes, and those are represented by the red bars. So what you can see is that there were a number of reads associated with transposons within gene A and within gene B. However, if you look immediately above gene C, you can see there are no red bars. And so what this indicates is that we recovered no transposons that existed in gene C. This is because, as you can see on the right, 
mutant three was absent from the population that exited our in vitro growth conditions. They could not survive because gene C is essential in those growth conditions. You, of course, are going to take your control library to then inoculate into your, your host, the, the plant. And so mutant three never entered our plant model system because it was essential in vitro. It could not survive. We could not grow it. And therefore, it could not be tested in planta because it was already gone from our transposon pool. So now we're looking at just gene A and gene B. And so if you compare the, ex the number of reads associated with gene A under condition A in vitro and condition B in planta, you can say, see that there was a significant reduction in the number of transposon reads found in gene A in planta. And so again, if you look on the far right, your conclusion is, is that mutant one containing the transposon hit in gene A is less abundant. It was eliminated from the implanted population because gene A must be conditionally essential and important in planta in our test conditions. If you look at gene B carefully, what you see is there were a number of reads associated with gene B in vitro. But if you look at condition B, the number of reads actually increased. It didn't decrease. So mutant two survived very well in planta. And again, so our conclusion from this is mutant two is more abundant because mutations in gene B actually allow those cells containing that mutation to have better fitness, which have survived better in planta. And we found both of these types of results when we looked at our data, which I'll, I'll get into in just a minute here. This is the overall work workflow of our study design. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we made a Mariner transposon library containing 40,000 mutants. We picked this number based on um, the idea that we needed to be below what's called the bottleneck. The bottleneck is a critical issue in designing transposon seek studies because whenever you introduce a certain number of bacteria into a host organism, not all of them are actually going to successfully be able to get into the host and survive. And so we did preliminary experiments to determine what was the efficiency that Pantoeus duardii could actually enter into the corn xylem. And we found that it was about 10%. Therefore, when we inoculated the plants, we actually inoculated them with about 10 to the 6 colony forming units knowing that about 10 to the fifth bacteria would actually be able to successfully enter into the xylem. And this number was above the 40,000 mutant level that we used in our library. That way we ensured that all 40,000 of our mutants should have been able to enter the plant and therefore this would not bias our study. We grew this mutant library overnight in LB, subcultured it, in LB to create a pre-inoculum liquid culture, and then infected 30 plants with that same culture, and then grew the plants for six days. And we estimated that the growth in LB between the liquid and the subculture and the growth in the plants came out to roughly the same number of generations. So we extracted our DNA and then performed next generation Illumina sequencing and came up with read counts associated with the transposons within our various strains that have survived under the different conditions. So in this diagram, a blue dot represents the read count level of a specific single gene. In panel A, what you see is a comparison of our two in vitro conditions. So we perform this experiment in duplicate. What you can see is there's a very tight linear correlation. All the data falls along a fairly straight line with greater scattering of genes with read counts less than 10 due to the fact that the read counts are so low, the statistical error begins to increase in the results. In panel B, we compared the two implanta growth conditions. And what you can see is, again, the data points fall along a linear pattern, but there's much more scatter. And this has to do with, with the fact that we're dealing with a less controlled environment being implanta 
And we also are dealing with um, potential bottleneck issues that did not exist in the in vitro culture. We believe all 40,000 of our mutants were in there, but it caused us to get lower numbers of recounts. So, for example, in LB, we were getting a great more than a million reads per sample, whereas in plants, we were getting on the order of 300 to 500,000 reads per sample. Because of differences between the samples, we decided not to average our data, but we instead did a pairwise comparison. And that is shown in panels C and D. So we took one in vitro sample, compared it to one in plants sample, and then repeated that for the second sample, and then looked for consistent patterns between those two data analyses. So this information was, um, underwent a lot of bioinformatic analysis, and our findings are summarized here. So for the LB grown library, we found that there were 169 genes just growing in LB for which we could recover no recounts. So we consider these genes to be absolutely essential for growth in LB. Of these 169 genes, 71 encoded hypothetical proteins for which there is no annotated function. On top of this, there were another 406 genes that gave us incredibly low read counts between zero and 10 across both of the LB samples. And so we also consider that these genes are probably very, very important for survival just in the in vitro growth conditions. And therefore their quantities were gonna be restricted entering the plant. So when we considered which genes to analyze from the implant analysis, we used 3,528 genes, and all of these genes had re have recounts greater than 10 from the LB library. When we looked in Planta, what we found was that well, there were almost 500 genes that appeared to be very important for Implanta growth and survival. These were genes that had more than 10-fold lower recounts in Planta versus the LB control. So the mutants carrying transposons in those genes were not able to survive well in planta. We did have a small number of genes, six to be precise, that actually were from strains that gained better fitness in planta than in the LB. And four of these genes were associated with regulation of capsule production, RCS, A, B, C, and D, and two hypothetical proteins of unknown function. So for the, the capsule producing or regulating functions, this somewhat makes sense to us because capsule costs the cell a lot of energy. If all of your neighbors in the population are already making capsule and you can save energy by borrowing capsule from them or you can essentially be a cheater, you can save energy and survive better than your neighbors that are expending energy to make this capsule. We wanted to, again, perform a secondary analysis to validate some of our results. And so we picked a number of genes to perform additional implant of validations. For this, we picked two genes that we already had in our library, LRHA, which again encodes a transcription factor regulating surface motility, and RCSA that encodes a transcription factor regulating capsule production. And then in addition, we picked three genes that we found to have very, very low recounts in planta. This included OMC that encodes a general porin. Porins are outer membrane proteins that are important for controlling the diffusion of small molecules across the outer membrane and are also are regulated in response to external stresses, especially osmotic stresses. OMP A was another outer membrane protein that we found to be highly upregulated in planta. And interestingly, outer membrane proteins have been associated to be virulence factors in some other animal models. The third gene we picked was LON. LON encodes uh, protease, and this would be important for stress responses. The first assay that we performed was a competition assay. And what we did was we wanted to analyze our five mutant strains. So the, the genes at the bottom, we tested deletions in those genes, and we asked how could those mutant strains compete in a one-to-one -one ratio with the wild-type strain. 
So if a gene mutation enhances the fitness of the mutant, the fitness is going to outcompete the wild type. And that is what you see for RCSA, and that is what we had predicted. So the relative competitive index for the deletion in RCSA was greater than 10. It outcompeted the wild type, again, presumably because it did not have to make capsule. It was um, cheating and taking capsule from the wild type cells around it that were expending energy to make the capsule. A gene that is detrimental to survival in plants, it will have a relative competitive index less than one. And so you can see this clearly for OMC and LON. And so what this did is it confirmed our TNSeq analysis that if you have a mutation in OMC or a mutation in LON, those mutants are less able to compete against the wild type and they will be eliminated from the population over time. LRHA had a competitive index of exactly one and this was not surprising to us as we were not predicting that it would really be an advantage or a disadvantage for the cell to have a deletion in LRHA based on our TNC analysis. The one result that did not meet our expectations or our predictions was the deletion in OMP A. As you can see, the deletion in OMP A actually competed better than the wild type, or, and we would have predicted the opposite it would have been a disadvantage. We hypothesized that perhaps this was due to the fact that in the TNC analysis, you have a mixed population of thousands of mutants, and the A mutant in there was a very small fractional population. So we repeated these competition assays at a ratio of one to nine, with the AMP A being at a lower ratio than before, but we observed the same results. So we don't know if we we change the ratio even more, we might see a result, or there might be some other explanation for this finding, such as some kind of unknown polar effect on our AMPE mutant in the uh, TNC analysis that led to our, some of our findings. But because of this, we decided we wanted to perform a, a, another analysis just to see if we could see any phenotype attributed to the AMPE mutant. And so we performed classic um, plant virulence assays. And so we used the xylem infection model to inoculate young corn seedlings with pure cultures of our different strains of interest. And then we scored the disease severity. So a score of zero means you have a very healthy, vibrant, non-diseased plant, whereas a score of five indicates that the plant is dead due to wilt disease. And so starting on the left, what you see is our negative control, the phosphate buffered saline, gave us no disease symptoms, whereas the wild type strain gave us a disease score of three, indicating intermediate or fairly high disease levels. If you look at our three mutants, the deletion for OMC, OMP A, and LON, you can see that they all had de decreased virulence. And this decreased virulence was statistically significant for the deletion in OMP A and the deletion in LON. So these genes are important for causing disease in the plant. OMP C was also decreased, and it just barely missed our statistical cutoff. So we believe it also does play an important role in disease. The other three bars that you see are the complementation strains for the various mutants. And they all, to varying degrees, increased the disease um, score. And they were all statistically equivalent to the wild type. So in conclusion, what we have learned from our TNSeq analysis so far is that we were able to identify over 500 genes that are important for growth um, in vivo in the plant. And we also identified genes that are just important for in vitro LB growth conditions as well. But of course, our interest was the ones that were important in the plant. We selected five of these genes to perform some initial plant assays, and we have established new roles for the genes OMC and LON, and the ability of Pantoea astwardii to grow and survive in the plant, and the ability of OMP A and LON to <clears throat> cause in the plant. We, in the future, would like to investigate additional genes that we identified by our TNSeq analysis. And we'd like to perform a second TNSeq analysis by studying 
the early stages of Pantoja stewardii infection in the leaf apoplast in collaboration with our colleague David Mackey. Overall, these findings are giving us a broader understanding of the bacterium's lifestyle in corn, and we hope ultimately might in the future lead to some possible disease intervention strategies. I'd like to briefly conclude by acknowledging that when I say we, it is they, my students, that have done the work. So I have three past graduate students, Allison, Anne, and Ravithi, that performed much of the work, and Holly Packard as well, who's still a current student in the lab, working with undergraduate students, Brandy Thomas and Chase Mullins. I want to thank our collaborators, Rick Jensen, who's our bioinformatician, and David Mackey at Ohio State, and of course, our funding sources. And I'll be happy to respond to questions that you send in. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Dr. Stevens, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on the screen, and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. So let's get started. Our first question is, what is known about the growth and survival of Pantoea stewardi inside the corn flea beetle insect vector? Unfortunately, we have very limited knowledge about how Pantoea stewardii interacts with its insect host. The beetle has never been successfully raised in captivity through its entire life cycle to establish a breeding colony. What is known is that the um, Pantoea stewardii survives in the gut of the beetle and in the intestinal tract, and it overwinters in the beetle. And there's some evidence to suggest that, um, first of all, there is strong evidence that the type three secretion system is important for the interaction of Pantoea stewardii with its beetle host. And there's suggestion that Pantoea stewardii actually becomes intracellular within the epithelial cells of the insect's intestinal tract. Are the quorum sensing genes ESA-R and ESA-I essential for growth in planta? We did not identify the quorum sensing genes through our TNSeq analysis as being essential for growth and survival. And this isn't necessarily surprising as similar to RCSA, the mutants that are defective in quorum sensing, for example, those cells that cannot produce the AHL signal, can actually borrow the signal or steal the signal from their neighbors. And so the fact that they were not considered essential actually made some sense to us. And it looks like we have time for one more question. Is there a strong correlation between the bacterial genes most upregulated in planta and the bacterial genes considered to be the most essential for survival and growth? No, and this was a big surprise to us. We initially were thinking that there would be a strong correlation, but after subsequent analysis, it kind of makes sense. So for example, in our transcriptome analysis, we found that transporters were highly upregulated, but there were a lot of transporters. Therefore, if you have a mutation in one, the cell can still survive because the other ones are being expressed. So therefore, any one transporter was not found to be essential. I would like to once again thank Dr. Stevens for her presentation. I would also like to thank Labrits for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December of 2018. You will receive an email from Labrits letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.